The Book of the High Place, the sacred temple writings of the Nemenha, as recorded by the prophet Ogu. According to the temple writings of the Nemenha prophet Ogu, the principles, teachings, covenants, and ordinances of the temple or high place were taught to all people, regardless of their sex, nationality, or religious affiliation, and most especially to all children from the time they were old enough to understand the instruction. It was the custom of those who officiated as Peli, the order of Levi, to teach all people the story of our heavenly parents, as well as the creation of our first earthly parents, and to be certain that the recipient understood as best they could the principles of the temple prior to their being presented at the high place to make sacred covenants there. The teacher would make liberal use of that understanding of these things which the Holy Ghost confirms in the minds and hearts of the participants. In the spirit of the temple writings of our forefather, Ogu, we present this work in the same manner in which it was presented to all the Nemenha in ancient days. All the translators listed on the title page of this book are descendants of that same Ogu, and we have taken the responsibility as his children and also as teachers and as healers to convey this information to all of our children, both of our bodies and also of the Nemenha and other bands to whom this book may go. This is our gift to our children. It is given in the most sacred manner we know. Therefore, because we are only men and women, we suspect that you who read these pages will find fault here. We ask you to seek the guidance of the Holy Ghost, that you may have discernment and that you will not reject because of the faultiness of our hands the very things of God. If it be wisdom in God that you receive these things, then judge them by the same spirit by which you have received them. The Lord taught many things to many people by employing stories and parables. These conveyed to the heart and mind of the hearer a true sense of things, even if every detail may not have been related. The following uh, speaks of times before times, when men and women worked their way to exaltation following an ancient and set path. The players in the relation are our own relations. Each of us are also included in the story. Therefore, it is our story as much as it is theirs. All my relations. For clarity, we have translated names into their corresponding English meaning. Some of the names are difficult to translate. For example, Elohim means heavenly and is a plural feminine denominative. In the Menha, Pa Eloi means mother in heaven and She Eloi means father in heaven. Elohim means God the Father and God the Mother, and their united sense and connotes the sealing power. We have therefore sought to make the names correspond to something more meaningful to the English speaker. There are several voices in this relation. When the ordinances of the high place are performed by the people, each voice is represented by a separate person. This avoids confusion. The voices are Narrator, Elohim, Heavenly Mother, Elohim, Heavenly Father, Holy Ghost, Holy Ghost Elders, Jehovah, Lucifer, Adam, Eve, Satan, Peter, James, John, Preacher, and the voice of the mob. Those who participate in the ordinances ought to have good and clear intention for God will not be mocked. There should not be any manner of ill will between those who participate together in the retelling or reenactment of this relation. Only the best of feelings should prevail. The ordinances of the high place are specifically designed for the living. Because of this verity, they are distinguished from the vicarious ordinances performed for and in behalf of the dead in holy temples. This distinction does not intend to denigrate the sacrifice for the dead, but great emphasis is placed upon what telestial people may do in this life in order to be introduced into the terrestrial world and receive revelation and instruction from angels. The spirits of men and women made perfect in Christ, and even from the Savior himself, preparatory to being introduced at the veil to converse with the Father. The vicarious work for the dead is carried on in another place, by other people of good intention, and the Holy Ghost does attend their sacrifice for the sake of deceased family members. It should always be remembered that the Nemenha lived in a different time than we do, and they received from God that which was expedient for them. That they wrote specifically so that we in these days might learn from their experiences makes these records of some little importance to us. As I am only one person reading this audio, there will only be one voice, and it may be confusing at times who is speaking. However, the content I consider of great value, and so I make this audio recording so that perhaps it may reach a person 
who will use this information for the work of the Lord. The Relation of Heavenly Father and Heavenly Mother Chapter 1 Ponder the deep, Elohim. Is it not a great question? Look out into the deep, Elohim, and tell me what you see. I see space there, space to fill, space to build, space to do a great thing. Long have I pondered the deep and wondered why it remains so dark and empty. Should it not be filled with light? Should it not be filled with wonder and beauty? Where we are, there is light and truth. Our own parents provided this for us, and we rose up by line and by precept to become like them. Why do we look out upon the deep and see emptiness? It is a thing that should not be. We look upon where we are and see what is real. Out yonder there is no one to see us. Indeed, there is no one to look, no one to see at all. What need then has the deep of light and wonder and beauty? Our work is for the world in which we find ourselves. Why should we ask for more than what is? I am not no one, Elohim. I look upon the deep, and I would see what I would see. That is right, Elohim. Now, because someone sees the deep, I perceive that there is substance there which fills the expanse and the emptiness. It is matter, but it has no order. It is the same as the world in which we now labor, except that unto the matter which we do our labor, someone has given order. Therefore, the question still exists. Why should the deep remain so? What ought to be done with the matter? Why should not we venture to do the same thing there as has been done heretofore? Or shall we remain always here to act upon another's work? To act upon what has always been is not a bad work, Elohim, Heavenly Mother. Indeed, it has brought us to exaltation. In this way, all spirit children do arise, line upon line and precept on precept, even unto the state and stature of their parents. This is the everlasting covenant. Do you think to rashly abandon that which we have learned from our own experience? I do not wish to abandon anything, Elohim, Heavenly Father. But let us cause light and truth to expand and grow. Else, why should we be endowed with power at all? It is right, Elohim Mother. Let us leave that which we now know by virtue of another's work and make works of our own. Then Elohim Heavenly Father and Elohim Mother separated themselves from each other for a season and set about the work of organizing matter. Elohim Father found the task easier than Elohim Mother, for his endowment was to create by combining matter into organized unions. He made stars, worlds, moons, and other astral bodies. He caused all of these to coalesce into great swirling formations and clouds. He experienced all this creation firsthand by placing himself within the creation, giving of his own substance by way of pattern and form, and the deep matter willingly obeyed. Then he stood back and observed his work and pondered it. Elohim Mother found creation more difficult, for her endowment was in becoming a wellspring of life unto matter. She caused the deep matter to recognize itself as a living soul and taught it to seek patterns of order, and the matter did live, but without experience it could do nothing but ponder itself. Then she too stood back and observed her work and pondered it. See, Elohim, Mother, that I have been able to cause the matter to become organized. I have made moons, worlds, stars, such as we have heretofore seen. But the bodies have no life. Organization alone brings no real order to the matter. It is so, Elohim, Father. Look how I have given self-knowledge to the deep matter, and it does seek patterns of order. But the matter does only ponder itself and is confused. Life and existence alone brings no real order to the matter. Our work alone does not accomplish anything. Our previous work was fruitful because there was organization in life brought together by fathers and mothers. When one is without the other, the matter remains in chaos. Why should we work thus alone? Why should we not combine our work together? It is right, Elohim Mother, 
I shall work by the endowment of my power to bring together the deep matter and organize it into all the astral bodies. We have heretofore seen, and I shall consecrate all that obey me unto the endowment of your power. I shall work by the endowment of my power to give your organization self-knowledge, and they shall become living beings capable of perception. I do covenant with you, Elohim Mother, to share all my creative works with you, that the endowment of my power may be combined with the endowment of your power. I do covenant with you, Elohim Father, to share all my creative works with you, that the endowment of my power may also be combined with the endowment of your power. Then were Elohim Heavenly Father and Elohim Mother bound by their covenant to one another, and they became one in heart, one in mind, and one in purpose. This is the first covenant made by our heavenly parents. We desire that all do likewise. All arise. Each of you do solemnly covenant to share your work in this life and in the life hereafter with your own spouse. Each of you bow your head and say, Yes. It is enough. That will do. You may be seated. Break for instruction. The participants now pause in the retelling or reenactment in order to receive instruction from the Peli about the nature of the covenant and bond between men and women in this creation. Resume session. Then did Elohim Heavenly Father and Elohim Heavenly Mother become truly united, essentially bringing into being living things in the deep that could both perceive and be perceived, beings that could act and be acted upon. The Father, by causing deep matter to coalesce into astral bodies such as he had theretofore seen, and the Mother by giving the bodies life. Thus they were bodies indeed because of the truth bestowed by the Father, and they were bodies indeed because of the light bestowed by the Mother. The Father placed his own matter in the bodies, so that all things became his. The Mother placed her own understanding in the bodies, so that all things became hers. Therefore were all things of the Father and of the Mother, and all things were one. Elohim Mother, behold my relations. Elohim Father, behold my relations. And they stood back and observed their creation, and saw that a portion of the deep was now filled with light and beauty and abundance, and they rejoiced in their accomplishment. Then the father and the mother begot spirit children after their own kind, and they did populate their creation, and they did begin to teach them to become like unto themselves, by line and by precept. From the smallest particle to the largest astral system, the father and the mother taught their children to learn and to grow by participating in the creation personally. They bestowed upon their own children portions of their own endowment of power, that they also might create worlds, and thereby progress toward the state and stature of their parents. And when they had received these great gifts, and when they had each undertaken the work of creation, the children no longer enjoyed the presence of the father and the mother, for they had all entered into the everlasting covenant, and the matter of their creations could not abide the presence of celestial beings until those creations had progressed into that glory. Should any of them come into the presence of a celestial being before such progression had taken place, their matter would disintegrate and they must begin that portion of creation again. Therefore the father and the mother refrained from making their presence known unto them, but waited upon the plan to bring them together once again. Notwithstanding, they could still observe from a distance the creations and works of their children without disrupting them. Each of you created worlds in the pre-earth life. In the creation of these worlds, you participated in every step of development. When the first atoms combined to form the clouds of matter from which worlds were made, each of you lived in that creation. Your matter was part of it, and it was part of you. Because of this, in the face of great faith, the atoms respond and miracles take place. They know you, for they are your relations. When the first atoms combined into molecules, each of you lived in that creation. Your matter was part of it, and it was part of you. Because of this, in the face of great faith, the molecules respond and miracles take place. They know you, for they are your relations. 
When the first molecules combined into cells, each of you lived in that creation. Your matter was part of it, and it was part of you. Because of this, in the face of great faith, the cells respond and healing takes place. They know you, for they are your relations. When the first cells formed into tissues, each of you lived in that creation. Your matter was part of it, and it was part of you. Because of this, in the face of great faith, the tissues respond and rejuvenation takes place. They know you, for they are your relations. In every stage and step of development, from mineral to plant to animal to human being, each of you lived in that creation. And in every advancement and development, your matter is part of it, and it was part of you, particles and worlds without end, lives and deaths without end, joy and sorrow without end, light and darkness without end. All this because the Father gave organization to the matter of creation, and because the Mother gave thought to the organized matter. Because of this, an atom may recognize itself as well as that part of you in it. Because of this, all the matter of creation may recognize itself and that part of you in it. This is the continuation of the deaths and the everlasting covenant. For through it all things become subject unto they who transcended from the matter into the fullness of light. And ages and ages of lives of men, even eternities, are consumed in this everlasting progression. And immense is the joy and also the suffering. Nevertheless, eternal life is finally attained in this way, line upon line, precept on precept. And the father and the mother knew that their work was good, for it is by this everlasting covenant that they attain to their stature and to their endowment of their power. And Elohim father and Elohim mother were not alone in the bosom of eternity. There were others like them, as well as their own spirit children. But a time came when, when all their children were occupied in making their own creation and following the path of the universe. It was in that time that Elohim father and mother took counsel with each other. It is long since I have traveled about and observed the many creations of our children. I know that we will not be able to speak with any of them personally, lest we destroy their work because of our own glory. But would it not be interesting to go and watch them in their labors? It would be interesting. Perchance we may see something different. Then Elohim father and mother traveled for a long time observing the development of their children and of the new worlds they were building. This gave them much joy in the knowledge that each creation was one of their children in the process of becoming like them. After a very long journey and much observation, they came to a place where they did not expect to find people for they knew the creation and were acquainted with the nature of things. But they were surprised and delighted to find a small group of people living next to a river. The people had built rude huts of the sticks and of the reeds that grew along the edge of the river, and they were subsisting on fish and mussels from the river, and on roots and tubers from the river banks. As they watched these surprising people, they saw a curious thing. Moving about among them was a being that the people evidently could not see. From one person to another, this one darted, whispering in their ears. Then one of the men of this small family group took down his hut and moved it to higher ground. He also began gathering edible tubers and planted them extensively along the shoreline of the river and in the swampy places. As they watched, Elohim father and mother noticed that most of the people began to do the same thing. When the river flooded, only a few of the people who were left on the riverbank lost their homes and belongings. This they found very curious. They knew that the people were developing well ahead of that rate of development they had heretofore seen. On another occasion and on another world, they observed two opposing armies readying for battle. The defiant people were all on horseback and arrayed for war, each believing themselves justified, each ready to face death to prove it. 
Then once again a shadowy figure, visible only to Elohim father and mother, moved from the one great leader to the other, whispering something to them. Suddenly one of the leaders rode out into the middle of the field of battle accompanied by two of his companions. They stood there like statues until the leader of the opposing army rode out with a small party of his men. After a lengthy discussion, the stern-faced warriors turned and rejoined their ranks. Then all at once the two hosts began to break up and go in opposite directions. The discipline gone, and with it, all need to justify their position. The conflict was over. Elohim father and mother decided to follow this shadowy being as it moved from one project to another. It looked here and looked there, and they followed it. They called the being Holy Ghost, and for a long, long time they watched him change and influence all of the men and women who had listened to his whisperings. They began to notice that it was only at crucial points of emergence that Holy Ghost intervened, and that his actions had the effect of reducing the time it took for societies to move into that point where self-mastery and discipline is attained. Not once did Holy Ghost speak to the children of the father and the mother while they were yet in states of development in lesser kingdoms. Never did Holy Ghost suggest to the stone that it change its position. Never did Holy Ghost suggest to the willow that it alter its course. Never did Holy Ghost whisper to the lion, the bear, the horse, or any other being other than a man or a woman. It was only in the final stages of development that Holy Ghost sought to alter the course of progression. Finally, Elohim father and mother decided the time had come to make some kind of contact with Holy Ghost. This is not a thing seen anywhere in the everlasting covenant. Surely this is a new and curious thing. As they thus counseled together, they realized the impact their discovery would have on all of the aspects of human existence and progress. Surely, if one new and unknown thing could exist, could not many, the cosmos is a place of immenseness, and, although such a thing might not overturn all things as they stood at that time, was this not an indication that alternatives do exist? That a thing has always been done one way no longer required that it must always be done in that way. Such a thing does not unmake the universe, but it does remake it in terms of the infinite possibilities and alternatives to action. So they approached Holy Ghost and spoke to him. Lo, shadowing one, we are the creators of these with whom you meddle. What are you and where do you come from? I greet you. I am as you see, and I am just as you from this very place. Look, Elohim Father, this one is intelligent. Tell me, shadowy one, who of us created you and sent you? I am not made by any such as you, but I am. Elohim Mother, this one is not as we are, but I perceive that he is a personage of spirit. Observe how he does interact with our children, yet he disrupts them not in their progress. This thing surely is new in all the world. That is right, Elohim Father. This is a new being indeed, and fortunate are we that we may hold concourse with him. I am, neither new nor old am I, but my kind is many, and we have always been. Holy Ghost was not surprised by Elohim Father and Mother's curiosity. He had also been curious about them, but it was not his way to openly address anyone. His way was one of more gentle influence. But once the three began to counsel together, Elohim Father and Mother realized that there was a great deal yet to be learned about the cosmos, and there, there was much that needed to be done about it. Your children have I always loved. For, of all the physical creations, they are capable of sensing my influence. I know that not all unto whom I whisper will respond. Nevertheless, I have learned that the men and women, although they are like to the other creations in their corporality, yet they seem to possess a more refined center than their physical bodies alone. 
Should they be moved upon to exercise it, they do expand and grow until that center can be made to fill their whole creation. I have seen this produce such a transformation in them that they become easy to influence to do good one to another. Behold, I have made this mine own work. These, our children, are striving through almost endless toil to become like unto us. They are passing through their creative works, utilizing a portion of the endowment of power within us. Indeed, this is the nature of our race. We are all engaged in it until we progress to that point wherein we may command matter of our own selves. This is exaltation. All people like unto us are so engaged. Thus has it always been unto us, even to act and to be acted upon in the body, but striving to gain that glory wherein we may act and not be acted upon only. Thus we pass from one state into another. Yeah, thus we emerge into the exalted state, after worlds without end. Tell us of yourself, shadowy one. Who are you, and of what kind of being are you? Are you an unfinished being, like unto our children, before they begin their creative work? For they are born in spirit and have no ponderable matter until we loan it to them of our creation. Thus are they placed upon the road that leads them to the acquisition of their own matter. Are you like unto them before they took upon them our matter? Nay, Elohim Mother, I think the body of Holy Ghost is discernible only to those of us whose spirits are bound to their bodies. Our children cannot see him. He is, I perceive, like us, and yet unlike. My people are able to act upon matter in certain ways, but we are unable to organize it or give life unto it. We can cause your children to act upon their power to create, but we have no creative power of our own. You do cause our children to learn and grow at a remarkable pace. You cause them to advance in their progress. This is something different, Elohim, Heavenly Father. Let us stay with Holy Ghost and have joy in watching our children grow. Why do you not do as I do? We cannot interfere without great risk to the bodies of our children. Should we interfere when they are not prepared, their bodies cannot withstand our glory and they disintegrate. They then must begin again and even more time is required for them to become like us. The law of restoration is a cosmic verity. No matter whether your nature be ponderable or spiritual, that which has begun anywhere has physical consequences everywhere. It is probable that the process of progression you have described to me originates much discord and disharmony in the cosmos. For every singularity of harmony and order, how many singularities of discord, disorder, and disharmony are created as your children struggle for eons through the process of emergence? In consequence of the everlasting covenant, a great many errors are made which eventually lead to one singularity of truth. It is a way that attains the desired end, that much is proven in abundance, if only by the fact of your own existence. But consider, you were unaware of me and of my kind. That you knew not of me is no commentary upon your intelligence. It cannot be forgotten, however, that I did nonetheless exist, even though you had no knowledge of me. You speak of things that have always been thus and so, and you speak of a plan that causes much suffering. I tell you that this suffering is what caused me to come from the place of my abode, even out into the deep to ascertain the source of it. It is this suffering that I strive to relieve. The everlasting covenant is the way of heaven. It has always been and shall always be. If it causes much suffering, we are comforted in the knowledge that, in the end, our children do emerge out of the suffering to become like us. I am not convinced that because this everlasting covenant has always created vast amounts of suffering, but in the end eternal life, that it must necessarily signify that there is no other way to attain eternal life. What has always been is changed. What we knew to be true of a surety was true, but here is a truth we knew not of, but it is also assuredly true. The world is a very big place. Let us make an experiment. I am always alert to the opportunity to meddle for good. Look at me, Elohim, father and mother. 
I am not corporeal in the same sense that you are. I have often, as you have yourselves witnessed, made my sort of contact with your children without any ill effect to their bodies. Indeed, no, we have witnessed the contrary. Your influence has only been for the good in all that we have observed. Let me whisper what counsel you might have to whichever of your children you might choose. Let us observe conditions as a result of that personal interference. It may be that we can work together to fulfill the everlasting covenant and, at the same time, overcome some of the disorder it causes in the cosmos.